Hello, hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you, Kate? Good. I had to get up early. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you did. Um, I, I, yeah, it's always hard with Zooms to figure out the best time for people. And, you know, when I run a workshop, I usually do it about three in the afternoon because that's late evening for people in England. And then it's like early morning in Australia, but it's like in the middle of the day. So I never can go anywhere, oh, you know? Yeah. So it's like hard to figure out how to, or if I have a doctor's appointment or something. So it's like, it's always a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, it works great for me. I'm usually up by now anyway. Beautiful sunrises, right? <laughs> oh, it was. We've got blue skies again today. We've had the best weather this last week. Now, where are you at? Are you, you're in California, right? Or are you no, Oregon. Oh, it's so beautiful there. It really is. Are you on the Eastern or Western side? Western. I'm just South of Portland. I'm between Portland and Salem. Okay. Okay. In a little town called Wilsonville. Nice. Yeah. It's just, it's just gorgeous up there. Uh, my sister's on the, on the East side of Washington. So she's more mm -hmm. like in the high desert type. Yeah. It's beautiful it. out there though. <laughs> it's totally different. It's amazing how Washington and Oregon can have such different ecosystems on. Oh, well in the Eastern <laughs> Oregon is totally high desert. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, know the, the, one of my Ooh. favorite gardeners is on YouTube. Her name is Laura with garden answer. She's in Ontario, oh. Oregon. Oh yes. We follow her. <laughs> <laughs> She's like the energizer bunny. Oh my gosh. She gets so much done. <laughs> I know. I it. My husband keeps reminding me that I will never be her. So stop <laughs> trying, but you know, she does different things than I do. And we're we're going to talk today about some of the stuff that I specialize in and that kind of my wheelhouse is native plants. That's, that's what I know more because we've been restoring the prairie for a long time. And I just had, hi everyone. <laughs> so where is your prairie at now? Uh, it's in Southwest Minnesota. So okay. if, if you think of, so Minnesota, most people think of like the woods. If you think of South Dakota, that's probably more of what I look like. <laughs> oh, okay. For we're, some reason, I was thinking you were more Iowa area. Yeah. Well, actually we're, we're only about 20 minutes from Iowa. Okay. So we're, we're like in the lower corner. So South Dakota, I go, I shop in South Dakota and Iowa more than I do in Minnesota because it's, it's easier. It's closer to me oh. <laughs> <laughs> go say to a big city in minnesota yeah three hours two and a half three hours to go to the twin cities metro area where sioux falls is half that in south dakota so that's that tends to be where i go okay um, yeah we have some friends that live out kind of in that area too they live in south dakota but they're kind of right up in that corner yeah yeah it's a gentersons they own jewelry stores yeah. <laughs> oh, neat. <laughs> neat. Yeah. Uh, that's the most populated side of South Dakota is, is actually near the Minnesota border. So yeah. Cool. Well, I'm so excited. So, yeah. We've even been to the garden store that Laura's parents own. Really? <laughs> yeah. Garden girl. <laughs> I know well, that, that's what I call her. Cause my husband never, if I said Laura, he wouldn't know who I'm talking about. He'd think I'm talking about little house in the prairie or something. So I always say the garden lady or the garden girl. And yeah. he, he, her videos are very, um, like she has a really calming presence. I think that's, oh, I just can't happening. believe what all she's doing. <laughs> I know. So if any of you who are listening, if what you want about to the greenhouse she's getting, oh my goodness. We have a, a, a Hartley Botanic catalog because <laughs> my husband's dream, even though he doesn't grow anything except crops, uh, <laughs> really would like to have a Hartley Botanic. So we're talking about Laura uh, Laura of Garden Answers YouTube channel. So if you guys are interested to check that out later, she's, hi, Diana. Hello. <laughs> uh, she's a different, um, she's, she's, she's a gardener on steroids and, and her projects are incredible. So, uh, but she does a little different than what we're going to talk about today, which is a little bit more natural plantings, which fortunately, uh, this was so inspiring to me. That's why I decided to do this class because I got inspired to plant more of the things I already know and maybe encourage other people to do so. And one of the things that I see that's kind of a gap between uh, 
gardening and photography is how to jump between the two because you can find wonderful garden resources, but you can't often find garden resources that include photographer tips, like how to, to photograph what you're creating and everything with a garden, whether it's in your yard or at, at a, a park, everything has, you know, a seasonal basis. So knowing the right time to do things, knowing the right time to look for things is, is half the battle. And it's always a bummer for me when I travel and I just missed the, you know, the major bloom of something, you know, <laughs> it just passed. So anyway, hi everyone. So what I'm going to do is just keep admitting people as they come in and I'm going to share my screen because I prepared some pictures here. Can, I, can all of you see that? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, this is just going to guide me through it. Also, if anybody has any, uh, you know, if you need to take notes or you want to remember something that's on the screen for you to remember. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is probably talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it for questions. And um, I think it, it alerts me when people want to come on. Uh, oops, there's someone here. I'm going to, so I have multiple windows open. So if you see me kind of like gazing off into the distance, it's me figuring out if I need to add somebody or someone has a question. You can also pop any questions into the chat window. Uh, I may not be able to see that. Well, maybe I can open that too. Let's see if I can open the chat window. Okay, so there's a chat window as well. There we go. Let Tim in. Hey, everyone. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is how to tie photography to the garden and planning and growing our subjects. Uh, this is something that's super important to me. And it's something that I feel like a lot of photographers have a gap. Like they really like to photograph plants and with plants come things like bees and birds and butterflies. If you provide the foundational ecosystem, you're going to have a variety of subjects to shoot that will come to you. And I think that's one of the major benefits. You know, we can be people photographers and event photographers, but if you want to have some fun having a garden, garden space in your yard or in pots, even on a porch, uh, can start to attract these native insects and sort of the bottom of the food chain. Chain, and then you can start to get more of the birds and the butterflies and the things that are supported by those plants. So I think that's one of the major benefits of this. And it's something that I feel is rather haphazard with a lot of photographers. And what I'd like to encourage is more uh, photographers, more gardeners to pick up cameras and more photographers to pick up some uh, shovels and, <laughs> and seeds <laughs> and get creating uh, so that they can have nice subjects. So let me see if I can get this to go. There we go. Uh, so the hashtag for this is grow your subjects. If you are on Instagram, uh, you can use the grow your subjects hashtag so I can see what you're, are, what you're creating. And, uh, you know, a lot of people like to see the whole process, you know, see you planting the seeds, you talking about why you're growing them. And so if you have anything, if you do an Instagram story or if you share anywhere, um, even on the network, use this, this hashtag so I can find it. So April and May is kind of the time when the garden centers gear up. And if you're in a more warmer climate, it may have been going on since early February, but the, the garden centers here haven't even opened yet. They don't usually open until <laughs> things like petunias can go out into the outside without dying. So it's usually mid April that they open around here. And so I just want to kind of give you some ideas of things you may normally pass by at the garden center. And maybe you want to pick them up. Um, hellebore is being a great option. They only bloom early. Uh, this is called a Lenten rose or a hellebore, but the early bees love them when they are first emerging from their hives. I'm a hobbyist beekeeper too. Uh, so that's a one plant to consider. Now, one of the things that I think is really important is to think about underappreciated photogenic plants. <laughs> when you walk into a garden center and you see a grass in a little tiny, tiny, um, little tiny can or, or little pot, it's so underwhelming. You look at it and you're thinking, why would I want to grow more grass? <laughs> you know, I, have, I have a lawn or whatever. Uh, but the thing about grasses is they, they have a life cycle that pr pr produces seed heads that look oftentimes like sparklers in the sun. And this is so 
underused. And I have acres and acres of this and I don't really appreciate it because I have acres and acres of it. So I'm trying to appreciate the various varieties of the seed heads. And this is really beautiful for people who like macro because you can get in close or people who like lens baby. This is a lens baby 85, I think velvet, uh, but also for people who like to step back, it creates an airiness and it just, it fills gaps and it's just a beautiful thing to consider. You'll hear me talk a lot about it. Oops, I guess I got to click it up here. All right. So the part one, what we're going to do today is kind of go over the, the background and foundation and the why behind everything. And then in part two, we're going to talk about lenses, light and plant structure. So, so some tips on how to actually photograph these things that you might be planting. And then part three, what I would like you guys to do, and I'll show you where to do this when I'm done talking, I'll show you on the forum where we have a special uh, workshop area for this, where you can share pictures of your garden challenges, your yard, and, and that will be a nice like group discussion. And if you don't want to talk, you don't have to, if you do, you can, uh, it's just a time for us to kind of go through some challenges that we might have. All right. So this is the book that kind of started it all for me. And it's called planting the natural garden by Pete Odoff. Now, the interesting thing is, is he is from the Netherlands and yet he is growing with plants that I take for granted. Okay, so I live on a, on a prairie in Southwest Minnesota. And when I got this book, I realized what I was not appreciating. And part of the reason I wasn't appreciating it was because I wasn't putting it together in beautiful combinations. Now, native plants are different from the cultivated plants in that they are very robust. So one of the parts of the assignment I'm gonna give you at the end is to research the native plants in your area. Uh, but the thing that got me was the way that Pete expressed emotion through light and plants. And that I think was the, the thing that really uh, gave me the, the biggest high was that he, as I watched a, a documentary that he has on his life and his work, and it's called Five Seasons. And I think it's Five Seasons, The Gardens of Pete Odoff. And he walked around and he talked about the light like the whole time. Oh, look at how the light is catching this and the light is catching that. And, I, and he's a, a photographer too. I believe he took all the, the photos in the book. And I looked at them. And I'm like, this is gorgeous. How can I do this for myself? And I realized I needed to break it down a little bit and, and understand what plants give what kind of emotion. So on this page, I opened up to it. This is the first page I, I, I skimmed to, and it was the one on tranquility. And I was like, I want a tranquil space. And when I looked at this picture, I was able to break it down into the different plants that create this ambiance, if you will. And they all are light catchers, every single one of them. There's the hairy grass back here, which gives like a fog-like appearance. And when it's in bloom, it, it has little airy flowers that look like fog running through whatever you planted in. And there's lots of varieties. And most people have more options than I do. I'm a zone four, which is really cold. Anybody that's a zone five or hotter usually has way more options for these kinds of uh, light and airy things to interplant between things. And you'll notice everything's really packed together. There isn't like mulch and plants and mulch and plants. It's all together. And you could even do this in pots by, you know, putting every uh, different plant in a pot and then just sort of squishing them together and photographing it together. It's possible in any, in any capacity. Uh, but the Echinops, which are these little, little Dr. Seuss uh, blue ball popsicle looking plants are, you know, one type of structure. And then he has vertical structures and the airy structures. And it just, it's so peaceful. Like you can enjoy it as a person, but then you can also grab your camera <laughs> early morning or, or late at night and enjoy that too. Uh, he also, he talks about winter interest, which is something that I struggled with so much because the typical gardener, what you do in the fall is cut everything back, trim everything back, and then you wait for spring. Well, what Pete does is he creates with plants that have beautiful seed heads and seed pods and erect structures that stay throughout the winter. So whether they're pelted with rain or covered in snow, they, they maintain some visual interest. And that is something that we can all strive for in our yard. Now, if you have an HOA and you can't do stuff like this, you can do this in like a four foot by four foot space. 
It doesn't have to be massive like this. And it can be a very controlled garden flower bed, you know, that, that is acceptable to most um, aesthetic rules that, that people may have. Uh, but, you know, if you have a, a fenced in backyard that nobody sees, you can kind of go wild with it and do something like this. Uh, this is a Pinterest board that just kind of gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. I mean, when you look at these individual pictures, let me go back here. Oops. Let me go back. Uh, this really soft, you know, you have the soft airy grasses and the vertical structures and things like this, which is called uh, Rattlesnake Master. Uh, a lot of these grow in many, many zones. He's in the Netherlands and I'm considerably colder by a couple, maybe three growing zones and they do great here. And they also will do great if you're in so, you know, Southern, or Southern United States. So if you're in Europe or you're in, if you're in all of Europe, this will work. <laughs> if you're in some place that is very dry and arid, if you're in true desert, you might have to research some plants that have uh, the similar look that, that like your area but every place has native plants uh, that, that love their area. Here's more of these pretty grasses. And this is the thing that really got me because I don't like weeding. I don't like garden maintenance much. And one of the things that they do is, is congest the plants together in such a way that they crowd out weeds. The ground is covered by what I call breaths or pauses of grasses. And the grasses fill in these neg the, the areas where you would normally have to a vacancy and the, it creates this homogenous mass. But whether you like macro photography or more stepped back, you see stepped back images here showing the whole uh, seed heads covered in snow and ice. Uh, but you can also get in and photograph these structures really closely. Uh, it's just really fun and it gives you a lot of fodder, you know, in those dark seasons of the year when it's really cold or rainy or overcast and sad looking. Uh, it gives you something to do. And for me, it's just something I really was excited about. Another gentleman that I absolutely think is amazing, and I've shared a couple of his videos, and I know Kate, <laughs> you, you commented on it uh, the other day, uh, Roy Diblick, and that's this is his book, and I have a link to his CP or to his uh, YouTube channel in the forum. I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but this is the first guy that I found actually a couple years ago. I had seen him walk through a garden. I'd watched him walk through a garden and talk about his end of season maintenance. And basically it was nothing. He just left everything. And then at late winter, so right at the cusp between winter and spring, he just hacked it all down with a mower and let that become natural mulch. And he, it, it was like revolutionary to me because that's what we do on our 80 acres of prairie. For those of you that don't know, I, with my husband, maintain 80 acres of native prairie. And it's a process. Let me tell you, like I'm heartbroken this year because it's burning year. And every three to five years, we have to burn it to the ground. And it's just part of what the, what would happen on the prairie naturally through lightning. And, and it, what it does is it releases seeds that need fire to be released, which sounds crazy, but um, that's part of the, the life cycle. They need fire to engage those seeds. But for the first year after that, we have to mow it down and keep it about three inches high the whole year because that helps the seeds to establish and then uh, the weeds won't be established. So I can't see flowers for the whole year. And the next year we have to mow it higher. And then the third year it will just be lush again, but it's this, this waiting process. But anyway, um, he kind of takes that idea and uses it in a small way in his smaller plantings. And he's very well known. He's uh, done landscaping for the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago other major establishments that have big landscaping jobs, the ball, um, it's called the ball seed plug company. They did a huge planting with him. Anyway, uh, he's all about knowing your plants and also knowing how to plant them. So if you're clueless, have no idea, he really makes it easy. And it looks like this. So why I was attracted to this guy is he's really like the Bob Ross of gardening. I'm serious. He's like the most gentle spirit. He's so, oh, he's so cute. Isn't he? Isn't he awesome? Like yeah. he is, he is so like gentle and you just want to like 
just reap anything that he can give you <laughs> as far as gardening knowledge. Plus he talks about plants, like being his children, you know, he's just, you know, he loves what he does. You can see that he loves what he does. And that is the best person to learn from because you're going to just that, that enthusiasm is going to wear off. But what I love about what he does is he took paintings like these two from Monet and he turned them into plantings that you could recreate. Now this um, granted is kind of big. I mean, there's dozens of plants in each of these plantings, but on his YouTube channel, he will go through like four foot by four foot examples with just two, two types of plants. So two plants, four foot by four foot, he'll show you how to plant it. And it's, it's really helpful and on a small scale that anybody can do. If you have a flower bed and you'd like to turn it over to native species, uh, he, that's what, his YouTube is a great place to start. And again, a lot of the plants are very universal, uh, will grow many, many places in the world. All right, so the first things first, one of the things you need to know first is your soil, your light, and your zone. And the, there, there can be micro like subcategories depending on your yard. Like I have sandy soil on one place and heavy clay on another on the same property. So you just need to know what you're dealing with. And it's helpful if you need like your garden center or some um, somebody that is a very avid gardener, friend of yours, um, you know, ask them like, <laughs> what are our problems with our soil here? Or, you know, if you're troubled about like, what's your light coverage, there are tutorials out there on how to determine if you're part sun or part shade, that kind of thing. Uh, and then also your growing zone. Like I have two properties. My farm is a zone four and my house in town is a zone five. And it, that's because it's a microclimate. I have a very sheltered house in town with a fence around my backyard and it's surrounded by houses. So it's, it's sheltered and it's much warmer. Everything blooms a lot faster here than on my farm. My daffodils are like this tall. <laughs> <laughs> on my farm. So anyway, just you, you need to know these things because it'll save you a lot of frustration in the end. Now, this is my word of caution. Okay. This is my cautionary tale. Uh, one day my, my husband and I were uh, on the four wheeler and we were looking at these flowers and there was just this little patch, maybe, you know, 10 foot patch of pink flowers. And my husband goes, Hmm, I don't think that's a good plant. And I said, really, it's so pretty. Obviously I'm out there taking pictures of it, right? I made him take me back to go get my camera. Well, we let it go the next year and it got bigger. And by the third year it was covering acres. <laughs> and we had to kind of go in with a nuclear option and get rid of it because the, the thing about it is, is these, these, uh, na they can be beautiful plants and fine in other zones and other places. But if they're in your zone and they're aggressive and they take over, they will choke out other beautiful native things that support the bees, birds, and butterflies. And this is one of those natives that is very invasive. So if you hear invasive species, check on those in your area. Like um, Laura with Garden Answer will often talk about having Creeping Charlie. Well, that's super invasive here. So we can never have that. Um, so we had to get rid of this and it makes me really sad, but I'm replacing it with other things. But we would have had 40 acres of this if we had let it go a couple more years. So just be careful what, with that. What's that called? What I, I, you know, I don't even know. I, and I was going to Google it. I have a, a uh, I think it's a vet. It, I think on vet. It's a, a norm, a common name is um, wild sweet peas or something. Yeah, wild sweet peas. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. some kind of, um, I think in the UK, we call it some kind of vetch. Vetch, yeah, that's another common name for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Vetch. And, and it's really pretty. Like I loved how it looked. It was really pretty. But it, it just it just takes over and it chokes out all the native grasses, all the native forbs, all the native flowers, and it just becomes a field of that. And so it is one of those things that you'd have to consider. And be careful when you're ordering plants online. Usually they're not supposed to ship to places where it's an invasive species, but sometimes they do. So just make sure that you're not bringing in something that you're going to get in trouble for. Uh, yeah, I love this. It's called vetch. Vetch. Yeah. Vetch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. They even have seeds for it. See? See? <laughs> You know, right? You it, never it, buy it. Yes. And that's the no. problem. Well, it may not be invasive in Oregon. You know, you, you never know. Oh, it is. Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So you have to be careful of that. That's, that's one of those things you don't want to have your neighbor who's a gardener come over and go, mm, what you got going on here? 
get you get in trouble. Um, I love this quote from from Pete. He says, "A plant is only worth growing if it looks good when it's dead." <laughs> That's good. And I love this because you know I. I, in desperation, started to photograph the lovely dead crap. If you're on Instagram, you can follow an account called lovely dead crap. And, and it was, I, I laughed my head off when I first heard about it. I thought it was a joke, but it was real. And it's really seed pods, heads, and that kind of thing. And this is milkweed, common milkweed that produces these pods that pop open with showers of, of airy seeds. And then this is what it looks like in the dead of winter, but you know, you get the golden light behind and it's, it's really pretty. A motto to live by. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah. A motto to live by. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. <laughs> um, so what we're talking about here is herbaceous native perennials. A lot of what I'm mentioning is not like your roses or bushes. A lot of what I'm talking about are things that you literally can whack down to the ground at some point and they will, they can be covered by 10 feet of snow. Like they're really resilient and they they send all their new growth up from the ground underneath and and that makes them really easy to manage you know you can literally just run over them with your mower at some point when you know spring starts to to break and the snow is gone you just mow it all down and then the stuff starts to emerge and that's what uh, we have here a little monarch butterfly on a wallflower which is a biannual uh, that i have in one of my fields and you know this whole field that, that this butterfly is in just gets whacked down to the ground and we just did that a couple of weeks ago so why native plants i'm not going to go through every one of these things but if you're interested in reading them you can the big takeaway though with native plants is they're easy they like your area, they like your weather, they're disease resistant. They are most importantly that bottom rung of the food chain that supports the ecosystem, that supports the bees, birds, and butterflies. And, and that's what we really need more of. We can have a lot of beautiful plants, but if they're not supporting the native insects that make this, the food web and, the, and you know, everything work beautifully, we're really doing a disservice. And I think that a lot of people don't see the beauty in native plants because they haven't photographed them. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of native plants and I have a, 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 a longer video from a guy in Ontario who's a, a professional botanist, I think he is, and he works with native plants. And he talks about how people won't plant it because it's ugly. But it has really interesting seed heads and flowers. And I think that photographers would think it's awesome. Uh, so I, I just think it's really neat because they have really unique leaf structures and seed heads and pods and they just they're fun to photograph plus they bring all the fun stuff if you like birds if you like butterflies this this is what's going to give you the best shot of having a variety of species coming to your little plot of you know your place in the world now, um, how many how many native plants do you have where you are i would say that are well i mean you mean in total or how many do i grow well, if I were to go to the garden center in Colorado and, and shop for native plants, there would literally be a dozen. Yeah, I probably in, on our fields, we probably have two dozen varieties and that includes native grasses and forbs, which are like the food flowers. That's can, it can be kind of confusing. Uh, we'll I'll talk about that in a minute, but they're often referred to as legumes because they're things like peas that flower and they're really pretty, but then they provide food for pheasants and birds and, and things over the winter. So probably two, uh, two, well, when I buy a seed mix, so when we buy seed mix that we're interceding, like in the 40 that we have to burn off, we're going to put $4,000 worth of seed into that. And there are probably, two, I would say 16 or so species in the mix. Yeah, probably 16 or so species in the mix. And then the front 40 that we have is a different species set. So the front 40 has things like echinacea and switchgrass and native peas, sweet peas. And then the back 40 is going to be asters and a lot of different varieties of uh, just lots of things. It's a, I could go on for days. Um, but with, at your local nursery, if you have a native plant nursery, be sure to check them out. They're sometimes harder to find, but they will specialize in things that are going to feed the ducks and the, you know, whatever native birds you have, they are more specialized in supporting that. Uh, and you're going to find plants that are unique, different from say the patented or copyrighted varieties that you're going to find in your garden centers. 
Um, and also let's see. Yeah, I think that's about it. I mean, I, on there, they're just, they're just wonderful, but they are specific to your area. And the, the interesting thing is you, you're going to find similar looking ones in lots of different places, but they might be different plants altogether, but they serve the same purpose. Like they're the house for a different, or the, the breeding ground for a certain type of butterfly. You know, it just depends on what butterflies are in your area. Now this, this is another Pete Oda. <laughs> Quote, the skeletons of the plants are for me as important as the flowers. And this is just a, a smattering of what I did last winter from our field. Uh, if, again, if you like macro lens baby, if you like close in photography, I just had a, a really good time trying to find unique and interesting seed heads and, and that kind of thing. So there is potential for winter. That was my biggest struggle was just not knowing what to do with myself in the winter. And I'm learning to embrace what is there and realizing it's beautiful too, was a very big aspect of what made me excited. So one of the things, uh, and, and I'm just about done talking here and then we can let y'all talk. Uh, <laughs> we're wrapping it up, but the, the, um, this is a program that I personally did this past year in my house in town, in my yard, and I'll show you videos of that. And it was called Lawns to Legumes. And when you think of legumes, you think of like peas and beans, <laughs> uh, but those are actually flowers and forbs, things that, that house native insects. So this program was to try and do our best to bring the rusty patch bumblebee uh, back to our area. And so I, my sister-in-law was actually the head of the watershed district in our local area. And she sent out these postcards uh, to the whole city. We, I, my, I live in a city of 600 people. So this is not a big city. Okay. 600 people, literally. And I got a postcard in the mail and I saw it and I thought, I'm going to call her and find out what this is about. And she said, well, it's a grant. And if you apply and get accepted, you can get some free plants. So I applied and I was like one of two people that applied. So, you know, they were, they were going to do like hundred dollar grants to people. And I got like $400 worth of plants because nobody else wanted to do it. One other guy wanted to do it. So we split it. And, um, it's awesome because these are all native species and the, the truth be told, I got the plants free, but the, the prep for the site was quite expensive. Uh, so let me just kind of show you what I'm talking about. Um, okay. What I ended up getting were perennial plugs, and I will share a resource on the workshop area where you can buy perennial plugs. There's a lot of places, and a lot of them are wholesale. Some of them are retail. I bought from a retail one because I forgot to do a wholesale order, but um, they're, they're between 2 and $3 a plug, so it's really worthy investment because a lot of these plugs are two-year-old plants. Um, native perennials follow this pattern of sleeping, creeping, and leaping. And the first year from seed, they basically do nothing. You might plant a native grass and it's just one blade of grass like <laughs> all season. And you're like, this is not worth it. By the second year, it starts to creep and it gets a little bigger, which is a lot of what these, these plugs were two-year plants. And then by the third year, they reach their full potential and height. And, and so you kind of want to get a plug because it gets you started faster. But if you're low on income and, and you want to do it as inexpensively as possible, you might ask friends and neighbors for divisions because a lot of times perennials start to take over. And if you just say, can I dig up a little part of this and take it home with me? You can plant that and, and, and do that faster, get a full plant quicker or get like two-year-old plugs like this. And I used an auger to plant all of these. So we prepped the bed and I have a drill and I bought a special auger, which you use for bulbs normally. And this just goes and you put it in the ground and pull it, pull it back up. And then you just drop the plug in there. It makes it so much easier than shovel. Uh, I use that a lot. Uh, the next thing here, this, so this is what it looked like when I was done and, and I have the audio on here. So maybe I'll just play. This was from an Instagram story. I don't know if you can hear that. Let me see if I can just sweep here. So that's what it looked like when I was done. We um, hired a landscape friend of ours who does landscaping and he brought a machine in and took off all the grass. And then my husband is a mulch fiend. Like he just has to have his mulch. So for the first year I said, fine, <laughs> we will have mulch, but eventually we won't need it because all of these plants will grow together and fill the space. But he wanted to have it look neat and tidy the first year. So we did the mulch. Um, but this is what it looked like. And then this on the second side here is what it looked like at the end of the same summer. 
So they went from these teeny tiny little plants that were about two inches tall to, let me see here. Uh, you know, so this, so this, um, plant here is called brown eyed Susan and it's really light and airy, beautiful kind of in the Rudbeckia family, but it has little tiny blossoms that are oh, not tiny. They're about, you know, two inches in diameter. So not like a big Rudbeckia, uh, but it's super airy and bushy. And I, it was literally as tall as I was by the end of the summer, just from a two inch plug. Uh, because I think that plug may have been two years old, possibly, I, th I think maybe three. And it just gave me a full size plant immediately. So that is what the area looked like. And I, let's see, I also put in bird feeders. I really like platform feeders and I get these from, I think it's done craft. They're, they're platform feeders. I get a squirrel baffle. <laughs> I love squirrels. I feed the squirrels too, uh, but not on this one. And this, this brings the birds uh, right into the area quickly. Uh, and then that's my squirrel feeding station for anybody <laughs> wants to know. <laughs> I put corn and treats out here for the birds on this big old long table. So this is how you can start, you know, in your yard. You know, one of the things I encourage people to do is see, are there grants in your area? Check with your, uh, I, I, you know, there's different places you can check with. The DNR, you can check with um, the, ag the agriculture department, um, ask around anybody who's big into gardening and say, are there any native perennial grants going around and ask because a lot of times people who are willing to give up a bit of their lawn for something like this will just get free plants. Every state has an ag university too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's lots of, yep. Yeah, and that's, um, that's who, well, my husband works closely with the ag department here in Minnesota. So he's always telling me new things that they're, they're working on. We actually have um, 80 beehives on our property and I don't have to maintain them all because the University of Minnesota ag department puts them on our property. So we get the honey and I get to enjoy the bees, but I only actually deal with one hive that's mine now. After they put 80 there, I just didn't need to do anymore myself. Um, so here's the photo challenge for all of you people to do if you want to. Uh, what I'd love you to do is research native plants in your area. I think it's really helpful if people all research their own area and then come back and report back as to what they have because some people may get stuck or not know where to start. And if somebody else says, well, these are the, the plants that I found do really well in my area, it might help somebody else. And there's a lot of similar growing zones all over the world. Like, you know, someone might be in the Netherlands, but if you're in Iowa, you might have similar growing conditions, you know, no matter where you are in the world. Um, I'd, I'd like you to look at the plants and then just see what, what they look like in the beginning of the season, in the middle, and at the end. Sometimes these native grasses turn bright red or, you know, the seed heads are just really phenomenal, but they're kind of boring all summer long. You know, look to see if you can find pictures of what these native plants look like in beginning, middle, and end. So you get a, a feel for the life cycle. And then what kind of animals or insects can you attract that are good? Like there's certain butterflies that need to have just one type of plant in order to be supported. And if they don't have it, they can't grow there or they can't live there. Uh, so what can you attract to your area? Uh, and then if you get a chance to, and th this will depend on where you are, you know, if you're in a warmer area with lots of stuff growing, you might have the opportunity to do this. If not, uh, it's okay. Uh, but if you have native plants in your area already, um, maybe photograph them for me and then share them in the week one challenge area. And I'll show you all that in a minute. Uh, if you don't have a yard with native plants, you can always look at your local park if you have one. Like I live in a town of 600 people, so we don't really have a local park. Uh, but if you have a botanical gardens or something like that, go there and research and say, do you have any native plant plantings out and, and study those. 
And if there is nothing growing yet, you can always look at Pinterest or something similar to see if you can find those native plants. And then, so this is kind of an information collecting thing. The reason I'm doing this right now is because this is the time when you, if you want to get any of these, nat these native things in and you haven't already, now would be the time. In the next month, this is about the time when people would be getting these things in the ground. And, and so asking the right questions and not missing the window is, is the kind of the, the impetus for having this class now, because I love to see people photograph their plants throughout the year. Now, the last thing I want to say, though, as I am not against regular plants, I have 11 English roses coming <laughs> and I have and I have dozens and dozens of other plants I've started uh, in my greenhouse to, to plant out that are normal plants. It isn't just about natives, but I feel like natives often get overlooked and it's easy to go to a garden center and pick up a rose pretty much at any time, but it's not as easy to get this kind of thing because it is very seasonal. They often aren't as popular and harder to find. So. Any questions, everybody, while I stop the share and go and find the little forum area to show you around there? What about winter care? What do you do over the winter? Oh, well, winter care is absolutely the easiest part of the whole thing. Uh, winter care is nothing. <laughs> like uh, one of the, the, the ideal for winter care for this is to leave them up. And the reason you want to just leave the plants as they are is because a lot of native insects will crawl into the hollow stems and they will winter over there, or they will burrow under the plant crown where the, the plant is bushy and coming up, say a native grass, they will burrow underneath it to winter over and that's their winter protection. So a lot of it is just leaving it there. And then when the winter ends, so like in, you're in Colorado. So right, you're in Colorado. Yeah. yeah. So when it, it um, starts to fade, like, and, and they start to tip over, maybe it's, you know, early spring, and they're just heavy, you get those wet, heavy spring snows that just flatten everything. At that point, as soon as it dries enough to bushwhack it or mow it, you can go ahead and do that. And some people will take a hedge clip, a hedge trimmer that looks like a, like a chainsaw and they'll just, or if you have a mower that can handle it, I have like a 60 inch deck mower. Uh, my husband just goes and mows it down. Um, if you don't have a mower, you can just use some loppers if it's a small enough area and just lop it down. And then, uh, because it's sat all winter, it degrades really quickly into mulch. You know, it, it, it provides natural mulch because it's frozen and thawed. Now, if you're in a hotter area, it's going to be different. And you might have to go in with a mower after you bushwhack it down or lop it down and, and like grind it up like you would leaves with a mower. Um, but that provides natural mulch. But yeah, definitely leave it over the winter because that is the ecosystem that those native insects need to survive. And that was one thing I learned too, because the, the natural impetus is in the late fall or early fall to just whack it down. So it doesn't look messy. Uh, but that's what I love about the Pete Odoff method is that the way that he groups everything together, it has an aesthetic and an appeal even in death. <laughs> so it looks intentional and in, in its own way, neat and tidy. But one thing I was reading in the last week was that, um, you should leave everything. You shouldn't clear your got what we call them gardens in our, mm -hmm. you know, a yard, a yard. You obviously have acres and acres. I have a tiny spot, but they said you should leave it until the temperature reaches a constant 10 degrees because up, up to 10 degrees, all the insects and, you know, all those things that are hiding in the, you know, in the, in, under all that layer, you know, they need somewhere until it gets warmer. Right. So I thought, well, that was good advice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not the usual way to think about gardening, you know, it, no. it, it, there's so much that lives there and needs that area and it, never underestimate a small patch either. Yeah. That was no, I, know, I, know. I love my small patch. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, and it's true. It doesn't take much, you know, just enough to, to, for, for a, this, you know, whatever insect it is, the, say the rusty patch bumblebee to complete its life cycle and reproduce itself, it doesn't take much. And, and we can all help that way. And it's just beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, and what we do in the UK, people with small gardens, we have a corner of the garden, which is um, where, you know, everything that we cut back, mm -hmm. um, we, we put in that corner. It's somewhere for the insects to hide if they want to. 
Yes. 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 So, you know, we don't put it all in the bin to be carted away. It goes. Yeah, you can uh, anything that you can put in your garden that will attract the, the, the bees and the birds and the butterflies, uh, mason bees, like they have native bee houses and, uh, just anything that you can see that, that supports your native species will, yeah. will help with that. I had a footnote to Diana's comment. Yeah. Uh, 10 degrees Celsius is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm always bad with Celsius. All I know is when I was in India, it was like 40, 40 degrees Celsius. And I was like, this is really hot. <laughs> yeah, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that's awesome. Thank you. You guys you are do, awesome. Do you do soil testing? Yes. Yes, we do. And we have, um, I, well, my husband, as a matter of course, every year gets the soil tested to see what it needs to be amended with. A lot of times native plants though, they like it bad. Like they, they don't like highly mineralized or rich soil. That's another thing to, to look at. If you have a, a plant that's just not thriving, you might be babying it too much. Things like, uh, I love Russian sage and, uh, other sages and, and nepotas and plants like that, that are like more arid. Like you'd see them in the mountains of Colorado and they, they don't like, they like it rocky and, and maybe there's mineral rich because it's rocky, but it's not really like this rich hummus filled, you know, dense soil that's, that's, you know, full of organic matter. You know, a lot of times they really like pretty nasty soil. Our echinacea just thrive in our sandy kind of, my husband calls it the, the, the bad soil, which is kind of how we ended up taking it from cropland into native prairie because it just didn't produce crops very well. And I didn't want to see crops outside my farm window. So I said, let's just take this 80 and turn it into beauty, beauty, you know, something beautiful. And, and that's what we did. Um, so this is the, the forum area and you can just find it. If you go to workshops, it's just in there, uh, free it's the photography in the garden, native plants. And I have, uh, this webinar by the native plant expert in Ontario, even if you're not in Canada, he has so much good information in there. I have the recommended books I talk about in here, and then I'll just put the zoom lectures in here. And then, um, eventually this is going to go into the membership area and I'll keep adding to it. But for the, just the month of April, this is what we're working on right now. Also, this is where I bought a bunch of plugs the other day and it's, um, it's called the pollen nation. And this is like a, an example of what a plug supplier would look like. And they sell these baby plants that just come in packs and they ship them in a box, like uh, you would ship anything. And I ordered a whole bunch of different things from this company uh, for my garden beds. So I just wanted you to see what sort of a place you'd look for. If you put in native perennial plugs, uh, it'll, it'll come back with a lot of, of choices. Uh, so that is where we are at. Um, are there any questions? I want to thank you all for being here. I and, have a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, Amanda. Uh -huh. Hi, I have a lot of plants in my yard and I don't have a clue what they are. Do you have any tips on how to identify them or what I could use to help me? Yes. So I have a, an app called Plant Snap. Okay. And that app is somewhat helpful. <laughs> if anything's in flower, it's way more helpful than leaves. Leaves, it can be. I was trying to identify a plant in my grove. There, I have 10 acres of woods that I'm trying to slowly grow out and there was all these weeds coming up and I was trying to identify them and it was everything from poison hemlock to like some flower and I was like this isn't helping so there are apps that 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 some to differing degrees work better than others uh some you have to pay for some are free and I find that I, I have three of them on here I think um if you look up plant identification in your app store and then just look at the reviews. <laughs> like okay. some, some of them are better than others. And, and as a last resort, we often do bring in uh, people that are experts in our area that will say, yeah, you want to get rid of that. And this is this you can keep. Um, so ask if a gardening friend may know. But if, the, if okay. it's a plant that is part of your landscaping, it should be pretty easy to identify. If it's okay. you know, a purchase plant. plant snap, and it seems to have a learning mechanism 
I mean, what's if that? Take, if you snap a picture of a blossom two or three times, it's it starts to learn and it will narrow it down to the right one eventually. That's cool. And it might be that over the course of the season too. So like if it's oh, yeah. first emerging, it may just look like a hundred other things, but as it gets bigger, it will have more identifying markers that will be easier. Yeah. And as, if you can get a flower stage <clears throat> on anything, a grass head to a, a straight on flower, any kind of, you know, reproduction part of the plant that will usually be a winner <laughs> where they won't struggle <laughs> to okay. figure out what it is. Identifying is, isn't the hard part. It's remembering what you learn. That's the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the ba major drawbacks of books like this and the Pete Odoff book is it's all, <laughs> Latin names, which is, I taught Latin for five years. So you'd think I would be like, I can sort of, I mean, <sighs> I tell you, I don't know. It's, it, it's hard, but I get why they do it. They do it for specific species. So you know exactly what you're getting because I could say, uh, cat mint. Okay. Well, there's like a hundred different varieties. And so if you can get the Latin name, then you know that it's this royal blue one versus this like purple one. And, and, but it's hard. And each of these books actually is awesome because it has plant lists, some 60 to a hundred or more plants with a listing <clears throat> of, and a picture of what it looks like. Uh, so you can kind of see, and next week we're going to talk about plant structures and how you might want to start thinking about grouping it. So you don't buy too much of the same thing. I have, you know, like, oh, well, I told you I have a, all these roses coming, but I'm actually going to do natural plantings around it with natives and grasses to soften the base of the roses because they just, rose bottoms are ugly and you kind of want to mask the, the nothing going on down there while giving them space to breathe. So I was going to do like a, a kind of a distant border to hide the nakedness down there with native grasses and, and more vertical elements and things. So um, you can intermix different things. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent natives. Uh, anyway, any final uh, questions? How soon can we put our dahlia roots back in the ground? Uh, okay, so with dahlias, you wanna wait till you're not gonna have any freezes unless they're fully under the ground you can still have like a little cold snap, but if they start to emerge with their green growth above the ground, there can be no freezes. So I actually don't usually do those in the ground until mid to late May for me in zone four. Um, wow. Even June, if you're in Colorado, I think you might be actually warmer than I am. You might get away with it earlier, but I like to pot them up in advance. So all of my Dahlia tubers, when they come, I put them in a pot and I start growing them and I just keep them in, you know, you don't even need a lot of window light. A lot of people put them in their garage by a light or by a window. And I do have some grow lights. So I have them under those. And so I grow them on just so I can get blooms faster because they have about 120 day growth cycle. So if you have a, a small growing season, the sooner you can get them growing on, the sooner you get blossoms and you don't run into that hard freeze in like, you know, surprise freeze in October early that kills them all back. You know, I want to enjoy them as long as I can. So potting them up early is my, is my, um, tip. Okay. I leave mine in the ground. Oh, so jealous. <laughs> so jealous. All of you people on the East coast or the West coast, you have like zone eight and I'm like, you get winter. I lived in Washington state for a while. So it's like, you have the four seasons, but you're so much warmer. Like you yeah. don't get the 30 below Fahrenheit <laughs> that I do. We literally have, you know, we can expect 30 below at the farm. So everything I grow that stays outside has to be super hardy, <laughs> which is Where why I'm everything grows like a weed here. <laughs> True. Yeah. The raspberry forests that you guys get. <laughs> <laughs> where it's like nothing but brambles and tangles. blackberries blackberries yeah those are kind of invasive there too aren't they oh so invasive <laughs> i was like where, well, this where is are like you okay i'm in the willamette valley of oregon oh okay you're you're in is aren't you near where the the, the swan island dahlias oh yeah i'm across the river from it oh tell us <laughs> I ordered way too many tubers. Did you take the little ferry that goes across and it's right there? Oh, the jealousy level is just 
I'm trying not to be a jealous person, but that makes me jealous. I'd be like all over that. Anyway, um, so again, thank you all for being here. And if you have any questions, oh, let me show you quick. So uh, for the first week, what you want to do is go to the activity feed and then go down to, or well, just do a post with um, your native plant research. And you want to do the expand to article so that you have the full uh, blog kind of thing. And you can add more than one picture. And then when you add a topic, I just want you to put the week one challenge in there. And that will just lump all of those posts in the one place so I can find them. And then we'll just kind of go through them next week a little bit and then uh, dig into plant structures and light and all of that. So that's how you find it. And there's also a topic. So if you have a question, um, there's a general garden picture shared, and it also says Q and A, which is kind of off the screen. General garden picture shares and Q and A. If you just want to share a post, uh, I, I want everybody to to feel comfortable sharing because I think that we learn so much from each other, and growing your subjects is super passionate, is a super passion of mine, uh, because it's something I can do till the day I die. You know, I never have to worry about not having a subject. <laughs> it's 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 like a lifelong gift that a person can start at any time. So I'm sort of an evangelist for that. Anyway, I guess I'll, I'll stop the share and quit, but thank you all for being here. And thank you. And if you have anybody you. else who you think might be interested, um, I'll put the recording of this into the, the forum. So someone can catch up and join us next week if they want. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.